Chicago critics to join us and to talk about uh, superhero movies, things that we like, things that we don't like so much, where we think it's going, where we hope it's going, all of that sort of stuff. So we're going to chat up here, I mean, you'll hear it, but we'll chat amongst ourselves, asking some questions and such, for about 30 minutes, and then if you guys have any questions, then we'll lend whatever expertise or irritation we have. So, um, <laughs> let me introduce who we have here. Uh, we've got Sarah Mars. Uh, Sarah has been writing about film and pop culture for over 10 years as a film critic and deputy editor of LadyGossip.com. She's also a programmer for sh the Chicago Film Critics Festival and is a member of the Chicago Film Critics Association and the Critics' Choice Association. We've got Lauren Coates, who is a freelance film critic, a senior at DePaul, and a member of the CFCA and the G at Galeca? Galeca. Oh, awesome. Thank you. And Giovanni Evans, uh, originally from Guadalajara, Mexico, and moved to Chicago in 2015. He works as a producer and editor for Univision T Chicago and became Univision's uh, TV and movie expert. He's part of the Chicago Film Critics Association as well. And his segment, uh, segment Movies con Giovanni, airs nationally in the morning newscast, uh, Logos de la Mañana. His favorite movies are Bruce Willis movies oh, from the 90s. No, <laughs> no, that was for you. No, okay, okay. okay, you can share, you okay. Can share. These are all good movies. I, 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 there's no shame here. It was like, but, send me a bio, and I was like, okay, I'll share my favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I won't, I won't put you through that then. But let's go ahead then, because, to be honest, I mean, I'll start with me. I, I love superhero movies, but there are some very popular ones that I dislike and I have some concerns. So, um, to hopefully get everybody on our side, we're going to start off by just talking about our favorite superhero movies. So, Sarah, would you go first? Uh, my favorite superhero movie is Batman Returns. It's the Batman I grew up with. I was a kid when those movies were coming out in 89 hmm. and the early 90s. So, that's, I think you have the strongest heart for the stuff you love as a child. Sure. Here, here. Batman. <laughs> And um, also, it had Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, and so mm. you can cat women, and they will be excellent, <laughs> but none will be licking a whip like Michelle Pfeiffer. Mm. <laughs> um, I'd say my favorite superhero movie is Spider-Man 3. I think the upon <laughs> enjoyment value, rewatch upon rewatch, that's the superhero <laughs> movie that I keep going back to. It never lets me down. It's always <laughs> as you know, insane as it was the first time I watched it. So yeah, it's what everything I love about superheroes, why I enjoy them, I think Spider-Man 3 is capsulated. I have to agree with Tara, Batman Returns is one of the, my favorite movies, Catwoman woman and the penguin, and I think that I look like a penguin, so. <laughs> but from the new one, I think that Thor Ragnarok is my favorite movie because it's the one that totally changed everything that we knew from comic books, like it was a comedy and I was like, what's happening here? <laughs> Very good. Uh, and just to let everybody know, we will not be spoiling Love and Thunder for uh, if you've seen it, so or haven't seen it yet. Don't worry, we won't get into any of that. But uh, I, I love that you said Spider-Man Three because that movie I've loved it from the beginning. The emo Peter Parker stuff is good, yes. and people that did not get that at the time, I'm glad people are coming around to it. But that is perfect. Anything that's wrong with that movie is not because of Sam Raimi. It's because Sony messing things up, and I think we're all yeah. agree with that. My favorite is Spider-Man 2 um, because I love Sam Raimi, and particularly because that gets that's the perfect tone for what I want out of a superhero movie. It is romantic and cheesy and earnest and visually striking. Um, it's just I, I like my superhero movies to be fundamentally about people in brightly colored tights having emotional breakdowns. And uh, when when we get away from that sort of stuff, I think we're in less interesting territory, but also kind of dangerously philosophical territory. Batman versus Superman! Yep. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, if you get mad at me right now, I think Zack Snyder is terrible. I think all his movies are very, very bad. So, you can turn on me right now and we can argue about it, but his movies are like listening to a bodybuilder read index to a philosophy yeah. book. I mean, just dreadful stuff. Okay. Now that you all hate me. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get out there first. Okay, so let's start with this question. Is the popularity of superhero movies a good thing? And the reason I ask that is because I'm, I'm old, and when I was a kid, um, 
Superhero movies were, you know, you got Batman, Batman Returns, first couple Superman, but most of them were like the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or the, the, the Nick Fury movie with David Hasselhoff or the Captain America movie for 1990. And if anything made it into the mainstream, like I remember high-fiving my brother when uh, Havoc showed up on the X-Men cartoon show because that felt like a really deep cut. And now, everybody knows who Rocket Raccoon is, you know? It's, it, it's, and so part of it is, there's a, there's a good part of, it, part of excitement that goes along with that, but in a lot of ways, superhero movies are the only game in town. And for us who cover all sorts of pop culture, we may see some problems with that. So what do you guys think? Is this dominant a good thing, a bad thing? What do you think? You have to split the conversation in two because there's the cultural conversation, which I think it can be a good thing because superhero movies, at least in the U.S., are how we process the collective trauma of 9-11. So it's not a coincidence that they blew up so huge after that event, especially about a decade hello? later when people finally started kind of yeah, hello. coming through the worst of it and kind of figuring things out. Yeah, then we're in a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting And on right the now. business side, I don't think you can argue that they've been good for the film industry. Um, uh, you can't lay the blame at any one person. Okay. I'm not blaming Kevin okay. Spidey. I'm not blaming Marvel I'll Studios. I'll, okay. I'm not even blaming Disney. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're in a meeting. We're in a, in a, um, in a, it's just, in a the Avengers made two hundred million dollars. Well, we're in a presentation right now. And I told my editor at the time, I was like, "Yeah, that's a big headline news story. Like that's going to be terrible for the business for you the next ten to twenty years because everyone's going to chase that lightning in a bottle and probably not do it as well. But we're going to be drowning in this stuff, which is where we are now. Okay. Um, and that part hasn't been okay, as good thank you. because it has choked out so many other forms of entertainment and you can make the case, well streaming came along and gave it to us there and it's like, it's not the same experience, we're not necessarily sharing those emotions together, which is really important. Part of the cinematic empathy machine is sitting in a room with strangers having those emotions together and it sort of gives you permission to feel in a way that maybe you wouldn't if you were sitting at home on your couch. Like just recently having seen Elvis in a packed theater where the ages ranged from like 90 to 15 hmm. and everybody screaming by the end and like clapping along with huh. the music and you know some of those kids had never heard Elvis before. <laughs> so that kind of thing, like we need more of that culturally and superhero movies are slowly strangling that out hmm. and it's the question is now can those other things come back in or does this rip just continue yeah. with 2020? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say... Let, let, me get, let me get everybody else and then we'll circle back around. Okay, I'm sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> I mean, I think of uh, uh, the matter it just so that it can come back and that we're ready for a new movie. I think you could argue that Top Gun Maverick is a superhero <laughs> movie. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's a superhero movie. I mean, I was a Bruce Willis movie from the 90s. That was superhero movies. Armageddon. Yeah. Those were superheroes. Uh, the Tom Monkeys, they were superheroes for some how uh, heroes at least. Uh, so most movies are a, have a hero for the most part. Yeah, I, I would actually say the skeleton of Top Gun Maverick is very much a superhero movie. Uh, but also, you're right, uh, studios are greedy, <laughs> and they're just chasing the uh, easy money, and unfortunately they don't do the, they don't do the homework. So, not every studio has a Kevin Faggy, and not every studio is doing it for the right reasons, they're just doing it because that's what's popular, that's what they think that we want, but once, over and over again, they're not delivering. I mean, that's why Warner is struggling so much with DC. Uh, that's what, what, what is Tony doing? You give us villains. <laughs> uh, so I think that if there's just one studio that is doing it for what we want for the most part. Yeah. I would say, I think in terms of like, is it good or is it bad? I, mean, I don't know, was it good that Westerns were popular in the 50s? I feel like obviously cinema evolves. There's always going to be, maybe not as dominant as superhero films have been to the point where it's, yeah, like you said, it's, it's boxing out smaller or mid-budget films because studios are so reluctant to greenlight anything that doesn't have a big superhero attachment to it. Um, but I also think they're very easily relatable films. It's getting people to go to the movies. I mean, we're worried about cinemas closing after COVID. Obviously, this is the, was it Love and Thunder was the highest Marvel opening of all time. So that's always going to keep the industry afloat, even if it's going in a direction a lot of people may not like. 
But I think at the same time, for superheroes specifically, I think the fact that so much of it is rooted in such this deep lore that the comics have that the fans are very aware of, it's created this new dynamic or conundrum between studios and fans where because they've known this character for 40 years, it's just now getting a movie and it's made by a director who maybe has not been reading every comic since they were eight. So people have an expectation and people can get very, I don't want to say rowdy, but they have certain feelings and if those expectations aren't met, exceeded, or even if something doesn't fall in line with what a person hoped, all of a sudden it's not that forgiveness of, oh, it's artistic liberties because you're decimating a character that people have loved for 40 years. Yeah, that's a really good answer. What was your question? What were you going to say? Oh, um... Uh, I can't remember now, but I was gonna gonna say, uh, yeah, I do agree with you on Bruce Willis movies. Hell, my favorite movie of all time is Hudson Hawk. <laughs> Hawk. And uh, I was gonna say, as far as my favorite superhero movie would go, yo, I know I'm going against the grain here, but there's a lot of good ones. But the one that, for me, sentimental reasons, Steel. Oh yeah, <laughs> Steel. Yeah, my that was one. That was the one that got my nephew into superhero movies, and it also rather personal because uh, I lost my uncle Joe at around the time that I introduced it to him, to him, and he lived with us. He knew him, and of course the fact that there was an uncle Joe in Steel. Yeah. Just, yeah. And uh, I watched Steel for the first time like yeah. a year ago, yeah. and that movie is charming. Uh, 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 yeah. Shaquille O'Neal is not the great. Oh, but Richard Roundtree is just pure <laughs> charisma. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah, because honestly, Shaq can't act, but he does have enough charisma to carry it, carry the movie. And what he did, didn't have, again, yeah. Richard Roundtree, more than more. Yeah. He was awful. He was light a city. Yeah. That guy's yeah. Um, okay, well, I want to go around to a couple of, I want to talk about that a little bit, because I like this observation, what do we want out of these, like, what is, yeah, you, you mentioned the right reasons, and I'm curious what those right reasons are, because... I'm with you. Um, I, I watched Morbius for the last first time last night, and I don't know what Sony is doing, but people love those Venom movies, and that made a ton of move money in pretty far, far into the pandemic. And um, I, I, full disclosure, Venom is not a character I care for from the comics, so and Carnage even less. But um, that, those movies take some pretty hard diversions from the comics, and yet they clearly make people happy. And so, what what do you guys think? What is that balance? Where should it be as far as honoring the source material? Does that matter at all? Or is the, the, the onus on making a good movie that stands alone by itself? What do you guys think? Um, superhero stories are literally the oldest narratives in the book. They are gods and monsters and heroes on great quests. And you can do whatever you want in the margins as long as it's at the base, at the heart of it, is one or both of those concepts. And the ones that fail are the ones that maybe misunderstand what people get out of stories about gods and monsters and heroes on great quests, which is usually what Joseph Campbell got to in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Disparate groups of people coming together to solve a problem. That is fundamentally satisfying to us as humans because that is human history. And on some cultural left DNA level, we recognize disparate groups of people coming together to solve a problem. That's why we loved the Avengers. It was people who did not get along, wouldn't have crossed paths in the normal course of life, coming together to solve a problem. It feels really good. Star Wars, um, Die Hard, yeah. still, I mean, it's a hero on a great quest. He's got to solve a problem. He's got to have support people helping him do that. Um, so I think if you get to the heart of that, you're going to be okay whether you go goofy and silly and bright like a Thor type of ITV movie or you go dark and rainy like the most recent The Batman, mm -hmm. which is they could not be more polar opposite in tone and style, but they are both heroes on great quests. They are gods and monsters. I actually think the Batman of any of the recent superhero stuff understands the gods and the monsters better than anybody, including Thor, um, which is a literal god fighting literal <laughs> monsters. But the Batman really got that sense of you cannot stand up for something, you can't fight for something unless you believe in something. And there's just something that really satisfies us as people when we see those two things come together. Uh, I also think that Hollywood is very afraid of taking risks, so they, also, they always want personal service. 
and they just realized that people like Tommy. <laughs> like, after what, 80 years? <laughs> they're like, what? People like you? Uh, and yeah, they're, I mean, now the baby became popular and they're thinking that they're a sure best, so they're used to that as yeah. the movies that they're making. And also, I do have to say, I think that people love the idea of, of Venom. <laughs> I don't think, and the promise of what it was supposed to be, yeah. but I don't think that they like the Venom movies that much. <laughs> <laughs> you like I the Venom movies? Okay, that's it. <laughs> and I love that, like, they put him on the uh, after credit scene, and I was like, oh, it's finally happening, it's finally happening, it's gonna be with Spider Man, and then it didn't happen. Yeah. They just pulled us again. <laughs> I can't see that version of Spider-Man and this version of Venom mm -hmm. in the same world. <laughs> they feel they feel totally different. <laughs> Anything? Um, I just think the question in regards to like how do you approach a superhero movie, mm -hmm. like appeasing the fans versus yeah. one. I don't know. I think if we're talking about the Marvel directors specifically, they've got that. As, as risky as that gig is, it's also very unenviable because you have to not only please the fans, you have to please yourself, make a movie you are proud of, but then you're also, where does the studio want to take this expanded cinematic universe? How does this fit in with our TV shows? And like, you know, up and down the list to fill all these requirements. I think at the core, though, there's really no other option than to just do what feels right for you because you're never going to please everyone. Fans, even if you make like to the letter, you could copy panel for panel, make your movie, just every shot is a panel, and people would still not be happy. <laughs> so I think as long as you're trying to make the strongest movie for that particular story or that character, whether or not it's close to the comics, as long as you're doing what feels right to you, I think that's kind of the only way you can go, because if you're going into it trying to please a certain group of people, you're doing the Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, and I'm a longtime comic book reader. My favorite character is Green Lantern, so I have dealt with uh, terrible movie adaptations of your favorite character, and that kind of killed, you know, my preciousness with it. And for me, it, it, it's 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 true in the world of comics. It's true, true in the world of television, the world of movie, um, books. Anytime anything gets adapted, it's going to be different. But you still have all of those. You know, I mean. As a old guy who who loved reading uh, the Giffen and uh, the Mattis Justice League, you know when Blue Beetle gets shot in the head, that sucked. But I still have all of those old Blue Beetle comic books to read and enjoy, and those aren't going away. And so I I I, I, I like the way that you put it, Warren. I think that's exactly what we have to trust the filmmakers or whoever's creating it to do. That they are trying to tell their best possible story and. If for whatever reason you don't like the version of the Mandarin that's in the MCU, um, you're wrong, but you, you can still go to the comics and get that version. Or you can go to the, you know, the MCU where you either get the goofy, very funny twist version, or you got Tony Leone playing uh, uh, the Mandarin, which, how does it get better than that? You can't complain about that. So, um, yeah, I'm with you. And I feel like as, as, other people sort of make claims to these stories. Uh, people that are new to, I mean, we're going to see this happen when the Fantastic Four and the X-Men get big, where there are going to be people who are going to be brand new to the X-Men, who are butting up against people who have been reading X-Men and know the X-Men for, you know, 30 some odd years. Um, you've got to be generous and let everybody kind of have their journey with these characters and make the meaning out of these characters on their own time and uh, according to the things that are interesting to them. You know, we don't own any of these characters. Yeah. You know, I was going to say, some of the heroes are born out of World War II. Winter, Winter Soldier, Captain America. Superman. I, what's that? Superman. Yeah, I mean, now we have Putin. Right? We have Ukraine. There's a new uh, theater you can write off of. Yeah. You know? And you can make a political point. Well, I think we're seeing that. And I liked your observation about this, the, the, the connection between the collective trauma of 9-11 because I think we're seeing that in an interesting way. We're going to shift away from movies to TV for just a second because the line is blurred. But in um, the Ms. Marvel show, we've seen uh, uh, Damage Control, which was this goofy kind of concept from, uh, that Dwayne McDuffie came up with, it is now Homeland Security. And uh, we're seeing them, we're, we're seeing the Marvel Universe try to take on these sort of ideas about uh, the uh, oppressive American government, um, corruption within the American government, um, in, in these sort of, the cost of fear, kind of our issues that we're dealing with now, which raises a question, 
is super, are superhero movies an effective way to deal with these questions? Because these are literal life and death questions for some people. Yeah, what do you got? No, go for it. Um, I just, if we're talking about superhero TV in relation to uh, real life current events, I feel like my gut is because we're talking a lot of Marvel, it's the boys. Yeah. I feel like that series in particular kind of answers your question. I don't think Marvel in its current operating formula is particularly well equipped to be dealing with that kind of commentary and I think the boys recognize that and is making some pretty great television because of it. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that Marvel can't grow. I think, yeah, talking about Miss Marvel is a step in the right direction. You have stuff like John Walker and the Winter Soldier series, which I guess you could call as Marvel's pseudo attempts at making some sort of political commentary. I think those stories, because they are, as you say, rooted in real life political climate, there's going to be an inherent element to that, but at the same time, when your movie, like Iron Man, staunchly anti-war at the root of that character, but at the same time, there are those are movies that are filming on military bases and getting tax credits because like they're showing um, positive vision of the military. So it's kind of difficult to take what those movies say seriously because of how they were produced, because they come from a big machine like that. It, it is really important to note there's no such thing as an anti-war movie, <laughs> except for 1985 Come As You See, which is really horrifying and recently remastered. Um, I think it, it works on the macro level as an archetypal kind of processing. The more you try to winnow it down and make it one-to-one, the more you risk running up against stuff that just stops making sense. Um, you know, Marvel got a lucky break with the Winter Soldier because as they were making the movie, Edward Snowden leaked the PRISM project, which was massive government overreach surveillance of citizens. Um, and that's in the movie with the aircraft, the helicarriers and stuff. Huh. Um, they got massive cold feet and backed off of that as fast as they could um, because they kind of knew if you're making, and it's really tough in the moment we're in now and everything is so polarized and people are so angry and justifiably so, but if you're making entertainment for everybody, you kind of have to keep it up here where everyone can access some part of it. And superhero stories have the sci-fi escape hatch, which is because well, there aren't flying robots and there aren't gods of thunder, so none of this is real and none of it equals anything that's happening here. People can have that positive deniability if they don't want to see the messaging. But if you're watching Miss Marvel and you see, you know, what's going on, especially with Department of Damage Control and how they're paralleling um, Homeland Security, especially heartbreaking in, I think it was the seventh, second episode, when I, I can only think of him as Stewie from Succession, but when Stewie from Succession said, you know, if you're going into this mosque, you know how they've been treated, you know that they're under surveillance, be respectful. And you kind of can't escape that moment of it just hitting you of like, yeah, there's a lot of generational and cultural trauma in that community that's been visited upon them over and over for the last 20 years, and even before, but really intensely, the last 20 years. Um, so you can have those moments, and I even think the boys, I know this is a controversial opinion, but the more they start going in that one-to-one direction, the worse the yeah. show is getting. <laughs> so it's like the first season was brilliant, but now they're like, this is that, exactly. And it's like, it doesn't work that close. You want to keep it, ideas work, but that one-to-one analog starts getting really yeah. tricky. Yeah. Uh, I think that the voice is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's scary because it's that's how the world would be if we had superheroes in the real world. It would be so scary and they could be like that. It breaks my heart that people think that is what it would be. I think it would, that's how it would I, be. <laughs> I think some would be like Homelander. But the fact that people are just automatically like, this is what it would be. It's like, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> what does that say about us as people that we think this is what it would be and there wouldn't be any room for Goodness and hope. Jesus. That cynicism is in fashion. <laughs> yeah. And we haven't had a good Superman movie to yeah. how to do all this. So I would say the last thing that came close was Superman Returns. I know, and that's a movie riddled with monsters. But <laughs> yeah. I agree. Yeah. What do you got? Yeah. Uh, so the doc did a great job of that. The very low was Peacemaker, where it shows the character who's on paper. Everyone's hating the guy. You're going to hate him, but he's also the character who's raised up hatefully by 
the acting Drew clan member, clan leader, um, told him in the dream where he um, the character no longer really likes to be brash, talk about crap, make them broken jokes. They told him, well, no, he's a good guy, he came from an environment where he's been on your nose. Yeah. But it shows him, you know, he gets later to cut it down to the first, I think, uh, movies with more direction and TV where it shows. Yeah, I, so we, I think we're playing a camp coach or something right now. Sure. And so the character who has a dirty in the background should be seen in some way. I think we will go for more that way. I actually think Peacemaker makes more space than the boys for the idea that there would be these scary elements if superheroes were real, but there would still be room for hope and transformation, mm -hmm. and not everybody would be evil. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's also the good thing that more people watch the MCU than the boys, because more people want the idealic mm -hmm. thinking. And that's true. That's a good answer. I, I do agree with the whole one-to-one -one analog, especially when they make it incredibly blatant what the what it's. It then feels like it's no longer, you know, like a story or something like that. It feels like they're just beating you over the head with a point. Well, yeah, <laughs> it, sometimes you need to show, yeah. I, I believe. Yeah. Um, so kind of along those lines, and, and the boys will provide a nice jumping ground for this, is um, all of the major movies, uh, superhero movies and superhero media, are made by mega corporations. Mm. And, you know, when you watch something like The Boys, it is parodying Amazon and showing how Amazon is bad, and yet you're watching it on Amazon. Um, and the same is true with, with uh, uh, you know, the DC Universe is owned by Warner Brothers, uh, uh, Disney owns Marvel, and so while there is this aspect of the inspiration, the critique, um, the community that can come out of that, it is ultimately also a product. And so is that ever, can we separate this, uh, the, the, all these other themes or our love for the characters from the mega corporations who also have all of their vested interests that goes along with this, or are those two things inextricably tied together? I mean, cinema's been commodified since 1917. Yeah. So, and even when people talk about independent cinema, <laughs> that money is coming from somewhere, you are beholden to someone. Um, there's really no such thing as independent cinema, except maybe like clerks charged on a credit card <laughs> and made with a video camera. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, I think it's inextricably linked, but I also think audiences are smart enough to know, like with the boys, yeah, everyone knows we're, it's, a, it's Amazon is evil, mega corporations are evil. We're watching it on Amazon, <laughs> just like with Wally and um, by and large. Hmm. And yeah. The point of that, and I was like, it's a Disney movie. Like, but <laughs> people are smart enough to understand those distinctions. Hmm. Yeah. And so it kind of keeps the corporate part of it at a little bit of a remove. It only really becomes a problem when you feel. And I actually do not think superhero movies, 99% of them. Are, they are not as political as people think. Um, they're actively trying to be banal and bland and appeal to as many people as possible. Um, but people can, because that's the thing we've grown up with for three or four generations, is it is corporatized. It is all coming at the end of the day. You follow the money far enough, and it's coming from some scary corporation. So we have sort of a instinctive ability to understand that and just step back from it. And that's, that's what my first comment was, there's the cultural conversation and the business conversation. Yeah. And people have an ability to kind of separate them. Yeah. I mean, uh, film is it's a business and these corporations feel they're, they're invincible. But I think that for the first time, the fans are regaining some power yeah. and it's been very interesting. Uh, the fans have been saying, like, we don't like this, and we stopped, they stopped making Star Wars movies for, what, now five years, six years? Mm -hmm. uh, people are saying, we don't like the Sony movies, <laughs> <laughs> even if they keep trying. Uh, and even with Marvel, like, the critics are saying, oh, well, we're starting not to like everything, and now, like, some of the movies are in the 70s, in the 60s, yeah. which had never happened before. And I think, I always say that the way that we vote for the movies that we want is with our movie ticket. Yeah. And for the first time, I think that fans are taking away their, mm -hmm. their money from the movies and corporations are starting to realize that, no, they don't have the power. And yeah. especially with the pandemic, True. that helps so much to give back power to the fans yeah. and not give them all the power. I mean, look at what happened with Eternals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's also just so much of it. 
Yeah. Rewind 10 years, mm -hmm. there was one to two Marvel movies a year, maybe one DC movie every two yeah. to three years. So everybody went to them because that's all that there was. And now there's like six to nine Marvel projects a year. DC's cranking out stuff constantly. Like there's so much of it that you can't afford to be a little choosy. And you can say, I don't like this thing as much as I like that thing. So I'm going to go to that thing and I'll watch that thing when it's on streaming. You know, like, not everybody's like us, but we watch all the movies, <laughs> all the shows, and we read the comics. Uh, for example, my mom, she's a fan, and she watches all the movies, but now, for example, for Multiverse of Madness, it was hard for me to be like, you have to watch uh, WandaVision, and you have to watch Loki, and you have to watch What If, to understand what, what's happening. And I think that the, fa the casual fans, at that moment, we're losing them. Yeah. And it's going to be more of a pick and choose what you want mm -hmm. to watch. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're, I'm seeing hands, so we're getting to the uh, the, the the question portion. Okay. I'm going to start with you, and then kind of move down that way. So what do you? Well, think? I mean, this is kind of. I, I guess I'll go there just for fun, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm talking about mixing politics and real life in with movies. You know what? Would, you know, Amber Heard and Aquaman. I mean, would somebody as a writer be tempted to write? You know, now that we have more, know more about her in real life than we wanted to. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, I that seems like something that would end up in the boys to me. Um, it seems like <laughs> yeah. of them. Um, end up what? That sounds like something that would end up in an episode of the boys. Mm. That oh, okay. Like. Yeah, yeah. It, the, the TV show has done a really good job being less nihilistic than the comic. Um, mm. But if there's something nasty and will make you feel awful to be involved in, then I'm sure the boys will make a beeline mm. line for it. Okay, I have to yeah, watch I that. Then. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Don't read the comments. Don't, do yeah, don't, don't, don't read the comments. I'm going to say don't read the comments. But let's don't comment. This one went real fast. Like yeah. you, you took a reboot Cisco and Ebert, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's all. <laughs> all right, yeah, what do you got? Yeah. Well, mentioning, um, you mentioned the failure of the term Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. And I think that ties into an issue with me and other okay, friends I have online that I communicate with, that we're getting tired of the superhero movies and that because they are these corporate projects that all have to fit at this point a certain aesthetic, it's kind of harder for films to have any kind of distinctive authorial voice in them. Well, we found and won an Oscar for Nomadland, but she just wasn't suited to make a film like Eternals with kind of control. A friend of mine the other day had put on, uh, she did a little live tweeting because she was doing some chores and she put on the movie Batman Forever. And she said, and she had a lot of music comments to make, and she said, you know, these aren't good movies, this and the other Schumacher Batman film, Batman Robin, but at least they're fun movies and they're not self serious and they have a clear aesthetic and vision and vibrant, memorable visuals and performances. And we're not seeing as much of that marvel of DC as we could be. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So what do you guys think? I mean, is there room for distinctive voices or do we have to, are we going to lose distinctive voices because they're never going to get the funding to make their movies and they're going to have to try to make a superhero movie? Uh, first of all, Batman Forever is a good movie. Um, <laughs> it's also the only time we've ever seen Batman and Bruce Wayne portrayed as the same person, not two split identities. Mm. Um, I think it's going to, it's actually, superhero movies are going the way of the Western and the rom-com, which is the formula is actually very limiting. Yeah. And unless they start branching out more and more, and not just like, oh, more jokes in color, um, but actually mm. thematically branching out, they're going to implode. It's going to suffocate itself. Um, that's already maybe kind of starting to happen. Yeah. But I do think there can be. I think the Batman most recently is a good example of they gave a filmmaker $200 million and did not make him tie it into anything. Didn't make him worry about this has to lead into that and we have to do the flash here. Da, 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 da. It just, just make your movie, man. Just take $200 million and three years and go make your movie. <laughs> and it turned out great. And it's so good that it will spawn its own little, they're going to do a thing with the penguin, and we'll see what that is, but I think they'll have to kind of go in the direction of loosening the reins a little bit, letting things stand on their own, even Marvel's going to have to let go of the everything to that. It's like, maybe everything doesn't happen. Maybe yeah. Kate Bishop doesn't need to meet the Guardians of the Galaxy. Maybe that's fine. Yeah. If they make that kind of space, I think they can find new readings. Let me get a couple of 
you guys want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I think that you're completely right. I mean, everybody, it's going to be difficult again to follow everything that Marvel is doing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start to start picking what we want to watch. <laughs> and just like what, reading comics, that's what happens when you read comics. You read whatever you want to read. And then when there's a crossover, we all come together and read the crossover. And that's what is going to happen with movies. Uh, we're going to watch what the show that we want to watch. We're going to watch the movie that we want to watch. And when there's a big crossover, we're going to come together and be like, oh, wow, 300 superheroes. But who's that? <laughs> <laughs> I also feel like it's worth noting, um, as like much as like we're talking about like, oh, the formula that they're all stuck in. And so now we're referencing, I guess, the, the kind of go-to different superhero movies because it would be the Taika films. But even those, you get people coming out of Love and Thunder saying like, that was stupid, like, how could, why was it so silly, like, why was Thor doing this split, like, all this stuff, mm. things like that. So you see people trying to take, not that that's any sort of a huge creative risk, but when you say, oh, superheroes are stifling creativity, you see a director try and take any step outside the direction and then sort of turn around. Mm. Obviously some fans love those Taika films, I am among them. Uh, Multiverse of Madness is another great example. Obviously, it wasn't a grindhouse horror movie, but when you've got Wanda like crawling out of puddles like it's the grudge, like mm. that's going to be a genre director specific take. And you had Sam saying, Why isn't this like my other superhero? Yeah. Mm. Worth, worth, worth noting, Doctor Strange 2 has made $935 million. <laughs> I think that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. With people on the end of the They will vote with their money, but people also <laughs> like to, to run their mouth on social media and say, This is what. I wanted, this is it, how I like, but at the same time, again, it's still Marvel, it's still going to make a gazillion dollars, yeah. it's still going to get more movies like that. I do think that there needs to be a little balance between the mm. studio and the director because then you have what happens with uh, Warner Brothers that when you, you have a success like the Joker or um, like the Batman, but then you have all the other movies like Suicide Squad that are a mess. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so a little bit of balance between a producer and a director yeah. goes a long way. And, and I think your question kind of gets at <laughs> The, the concern that I had with my first question is, is the dominance of superhero movies a good thing? Um, it's great that people who seem to be well suited to making superhero movies get to do them. Your Sam Raimi, Taika Waititi, James Gunn, uh, Ryan Coogler, these, these sorts of guys. But uh, Chloe Zhao doesn't need to be making superhero movies. And it, it's not, that movie was not nearly as good as The Rider or Nomadland. And those are the movies that I want to see her make. And if that's the only game in town, then we're losing out on a, a, a vital voice yeah. because she can only make superhero movies. And that's, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I want James Gunn and Sam Raimi to make nothing but their superhero movies, but I'd like to get the other things too. And I think part of the problem, that type of movie isn't set up. You know, if I want a movie about loss of faith, I'm gonna go watch Silence or, you know, a Scorsese movie that everybody hates on, you know, because that's, set up to do that sort of thing. This is set up to have a handsome guy do the splits and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, what was your, what's your question? Yeah, uh, I wanted to step back to, like, Peacemaker, which I actually was really surprised I love Peacemaker. <laughs> the only problems I have with it is, like, they make a lot of jokes at the expense of these very iconic characters, specifically Batman, Superman, Aquaman, and I, I think there needs to be at least some boundary where, you know, they can't just disrespect the icons that are the root of the entire you know, film. I actually think there's a really nice balance in the DC Universe for a split second, um, which is if if superheroes were real, there would absolutely be people who just did nothing but mock and beam them online, and that's the peacemaker. And then Superman from the net down shows up at the tag of Shazam, and the kids who would be Superman's prime audience are just speechless. And it's like, yeah, that's how they would absolutely react to seeing Superman in their midst. They would just be struck dumb in awe because they would love him so much and be overcome. Whereas adults would be like, that's just Clark Kent, right? It's like, that's Clark Kent. It. In, in my head, everybody knows it's Clark Kent and they just go along. <laughs> I was going to say, I was absolutely going to bring up Shazam as well. It's probably my favorite moment of superheroes, like a film acknowledging the pop culture significance of a character outside of their specific universe. I mean, obviously, like, we as an audience know that Superman is huge, so for ha to have him show up in the Shazam movie with that same kind of reverence, I think was a really charming moment. 
<laughs> to your point about people like Peacemaker disrespecting like larger characters, I think part of that could come down to not to invoke someone who is, is not a great person, but I think there are, there are a lot of Joss Whedonisms in dialogue. Um, set the tone, you, like the Deadpool dialogue, the Avengers dialogue, people are now recognizing and getting sick of the kind of snarkiness because I think people feel the need to, we understand like, oh, our characters run around in tights, that's silly, how do we make audiences take us seriously, oh, they're all going to be slinging clips constantly, and I think we've had so many quippy superheroes that have now it's getting to the point where audiences are like, okay, no, we can take a, a tight guy seriously, you don't need to be constantly bragging on him, which I think is just kind of a full circle problem created by people trying to initially avoid getting mocked me. And on the other side, you have Miss Marvel, who just, just gave us like the first time that we learned how the people in the MCU see superheroes yeah. with Avengers Con yeah. and with her, herself doing the YouTube videos, so it's like, yeah. hey, given us. Bigger than life and, and superheroes. You also get that in Multiverse of Madness, where um, the doctor, and of course he knows Stephen Strange, so there's a personal connection, but where you actually get a split second of not everyone was happy yeah. when they brought people back. <laughs> it didn't actually solve everybody's problem. There's been a real, this is where Marvel gets into trouble with that idea of the macro versus the micro and the one to one analog. Oh, they don't want to touch what would be the realistic fallout of something like the blitz. There's been no mention of all the people who would have died because of a lack of medical services. There's been no mention of people who would have died in plane crashes yeah. and car crashes and all of those kind of things. And it's like, ah, because you can't bring them back. <laughs> I mean, we're saying many people in the real world have said Thanos was right, and now they put it on the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we are just about out of time. So in closing, um, let's get some plugs. Where can we find you guys? So. Uh, you can and find movies, movies called Giovanni everywhere, like on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Twitter, uh, you can find me. And watch when you be killed. I would say, you can usually find me on Europe on Twitter, if you're a big MASH fan, that's my current session, so Lauren J. Coates on Twitter is my <laughs> And you can find me online at laneygossip.com or on Twitter at Cinesnark. And you can find me at J.A. George I.I. on Twitter, and then Joe writes words everywhere else. Uh, got a book coming out soon called Superpowers and the Glory, so find me on there if you want to find any more information about that. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for putting up with us. Being proud of you. Have a great time. Have a great time. Thank you.